Hi, my name is uh, Kuro Shiran. I'm a faculty in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT. And uh, today I'll talk about nuclear energy costs and innovations that matter to roller.com. I'd like to acknowledge my research group um, for some of the results that I'll present in this work, as well as our uh, uh, entire collegial MIT community uh, that has helped me uh, work on nuclear power engineering topics uh, for the past uh, 10 years. And I'd like to acknowledge funding um, from various sponsors, uh, particularly respect this work, um, Electric Defense, uh, Exelon Generation, as well as Fortum, which are all energy utilities. So in this presentation, uh, I will uh, compare existing nuclear technology to combine natural gas, argue that overregulation and uh, perception of nuclear safety has led to uneconomical performance, challenge the philosophy that has led to unattractive cost features of near-term class of small reactor offerings, and propose innovations that matter, drawn from bottom view of nuclear power. Today, nuclear energy makes about 10% of world's electricity. You can see majority of the world's electricity is still supplied by uh, carbon intensive sources. Uh, if you look at uh, just worldwide, 30 plus countries um, use nuclear energy. That's roughly over 400 uh, commercial reactors and 95% of them are water. So basically similar technology. And when you look at you know, what's happening around the world right now, who's building the reactors, you can see China is definitely building most of them. And then India, Russia, and some other countries uh, are building a few with the US, of course. Uh, we've only built, uh, we're building two now um, after um, a few decades. So if you look at fundamentally what drives nuclear, which is the fission reaction, it's definitely is a step forward in humankind's search for higher energy density fuels. And it's pretty, when you compare the utilization of uh, fuel in terms of energy per mass and compare the fission uh, to uh, other hydrocarbons or, or fossil fuels. Here you can see versus natural gas, we're talking about a 70,000 times higher energy density. And, uh, this is a practical limit, not, not a theoretical limit. Theoretically, it would be an order of uh, millions times times better. Uh, the other thing you notice, this graph is, is, in a, not, is in a log scale, not a linear scale. And you can see that if I put this in a linear scale, you can you know, see, see really the difference. The other thing you notice that um, if you want to actually improve our uh, uh, energy density even further, there are technologies that we can leverage within fission. It can give you even 10 times that. Uh, this is the fast reactor technologies that has been demonstrated in the US, France, Japan, China, and a lot of, lot of countries. And that energy density translates to a uh, favorable profile. So here's a picture of uh, three solar thermal plants uh, in the US, uh, totaling net 400 megawatt electric at 25% capacity factor versus uh, a couple of nuclear power plants in California, um, providing over two gigawatt uh, electric at 90% capacity factor. So you can just see the massive difference in, in land, land use, as well as the dispatchability of, of nuclear. Unfortunately, these two nuclear power plants are set to shut down short uh, their lifetime due to, due to just ideological differences in, in state of capital. So the physics clearly implies that fission should dominate, uh, and we should really, uh, particularly with our goal of decarbonization around the world, we should be building more plants and we should take up more than 10% of world's electricity. Uh, if I show you this, these two pictures, and uh, if I don't tell you which one is a nuclear power plant, which one is not, uh, it's gonna be kind of hard to say, right? Um, even though the fission had 70,000 times the power density, they look kind of, on similar scale. And unfortunately for nuclear energy, the, uh, uh, the one on the left is the natural combined natural gas plant. And in fact, these two exact reactor types, AP1000, were supposed to be built here on this site, but because of the cost of utility to go with the net combined natural gas, comes at far less cost and much uh, quicker. And so uh, you may wonder 
well, what, what happened to my density gains and why is these structures so big and, and, and so costly? Uh, this uh, experience of these two reactors that has gone over twice uh, over budget uh, and, and uh, over schedule has basically um, uh, destroyed any appetite that utilities have in the U.S. for large reactors like like these. Um, and so the the really the hope right now in the U.S. the future of the industry really lies on balance on small module reactors, which are smaller plants. So the utility has lower overall lower um, investment that they have to uh, risk when they uh, decide to deploy new plan. So now let's look at a little a little deeply of why uh, you know the footprints are on the same scale and why the cost is so high for nuclear. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, nuclear fuel, um, you know it's form of these little pellets of one centimeter in height. And each of these pellets can replace you know, 200 gallons of oil or, or 20,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So, so there's your, you know, there's our great power. And what we do here, we take these fuels and stack them in the cylindrical rods, encapsulated by, by zircoil, zerk which is a material. And then we put these in an assembly, about uh, 300 of them. Uh, and then we take these assemblies and we have 200 of them that make up this core here. In this reactor pressure vessel, that's about you know, 13 meters high and four meters in diameter. So you can see that the fuel itself, you know, you know, by volume, almost takes half the uh, space um, of the of the reactor pressure vessel. So we still, you know, more or less conserve that high power density. But when you look at where this pressure vessel is actually situated within the entire plant, you see that while well, this is actually the largest single equipment overall. It's actually a very small uh, part of the nuclear power plant. You can see things like emergency systems here, like in the auxiliary building, you can see a containment building, and then you can see the thermal machinery side. And there's a lot of other systems. This cartoon is not, not shown. So right off the back, when you combine um, an existing plant to combine natural gas, we lose factor of two in energy density because we're factor of two uh, less efficient in terms of transferring heat to electricity. And that has to do with uh, you know the fuel technology we have. It can't really operate with uh, supercritical water or hard temperature water because of material concern. So we are right off the back, you know, limited to around 300 degrees C. So we end up with very low efficiencies compared to fossil fuels. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing that makes nuclear more uh, costly than the actual capital cost is it's an extremely regulated industry. And uh, there are some good reasons for it because nuclear hazard does not exist in a natural gas plant. And nuclear hazard is what's unique about it is that uh, when the fission reaction happens, the of fission remain radioactive and actually they remain generating heat. So if you shut down the fission reaction, you're continuously generating power. And that's why you have these you know, emergency uh, uh, cooling and auxiliary cooling system because you have to constantly remove heat from the uh, reactor core. And typically, you have you know, uh, four or five of these and, 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 and diverse uh, systems as well, which ends up in you know, ballooning the, the, the cost. Uh, the other reason those, those uh, plants I showed you um, in the US were uh, so overcast and overrun, uh, simply because in the US, we just haven't built anything. And whether it's solar project, wind project, natural gas project, if it's first of a kind, you're always going to have a lot of first of a kind um, issues. So that was the story about the capital costs combined, uh, comparing the natural gas. Let's look at how do we operate these reactors compared to natural gas. You look at a combined natural gas plant, you roughly have 40 people on site per, per let's say, 1,000 megawatt electric plant. For nuclear power plant, you have 500 plus. Let's see why. If you look at the operations and training crew, for natural gas plant, you need 20 people. For new plant, you have over seven goes really back to strict training and oversight. So you can imagine in a nuclear power plant, in order to make sure all the actions of the operator is correct, you need multiple supervisors. And since you have multiple supervisors, your crew is bigger. Nuclear power plants operates 24 seven. So you need multiple, at least you know, four or five crews to cover the 24 seven shift. And then those four or five crews, you need training. So you need additional crew, couple of crews to just train them. Uh, and these crews always go on constantly doing tests so if you want fails, you need to have a really backup of a backup. So really it balloons up. Now, recent work by um, Advanced Nuclear Community, particularly um, 
uh, the new scale uh, small module reactor plant. Um, experience with the US NRC it's, it's shown that you know the, the, the regulatory um, commission that regulates nuclear is open to uh, you know reducing this number of operational staff and yet you know keep them uh, integrity. So, so you're gonna probably see a staff of maybe like 30 um, 30 to 40 in, in, in the future instead of 100. Loss prevention is, is a huge difference compared to natural gas. In a natural gas plant, you know, fizzles and flame, you know, there, there's, you know, you, you see that you hear in the news and that is in the next day you don't hear about it. The nuclear power plants, if you have radiation released to, to the environment, it's going to be a costly, very, very costly endeavor as shown in Fukushima accident. And uh, there's also about 100 security guards uh, that are there to make sure there's not an invasion of the nuclear power plant. Um, uh, by like other countries or terrorist groups. And then that's definitely, you know, it's completely different than a natural gas plant. So for advanced nuclear, you know, maybe if it's really small or has some certain features, you know, you can maybe argue to go down uh, all the way to 10, uh, maybe, but at the end of the, you know, you'll, you'll have to have similar level of security for, for different nuclear technology. Engineering, um, Really here, it becomes a difference in philosophy. These existing uh, plants were built in the 60s and 70s, and they still operate, as I'll talk about, for many, many decades <laughs> uh, going on. And back then, you know, the tradition was, including fossil industry, to hire, you know, the local people, have a person dedicated to a certain... But nowadays, the, the, you know, the kind of the, the thing to do, uh, basically, uh, reduce cost and be more efficient, the vendor or have a subcontract or have some, some kind of a remote uh, operator. Now, I think that a nuclear technology that's gonna, you know, uh, stop it from doing that. Uh, many countries in, um, you know, that have newer power, they do that. Um, so it's a really a different philosophy. So in advanced nuclear, we can definitely cut down the engineering. You're gonna still have a little bit more than a natural gas plant because the fuel engineering does, it, it is a more uh, specialized thing. On the maintenance side, again, similar to the philosophy, except for nuclear, you do have the radiation hazard. So you need to have physicists and some kind of people who understand the radiation and monitoring. So you, you, you're gonna need some extra people. So it boils down that for even the next generation, you need a higher than the natural gas uh, plant. So kind of losing the capital side because of all those other reasons and operational reasons. We're also going to be looking at, but it's not as grim as, as I pointed out. Thankfully, if you look at the uh, LCOE distribution, a majority of the nuclear power plant is for its fixed ORM and particularly on the capital cost. Uh, and and the fuel cost is the variable low and small compatible gas. Yes. So we have an opportunity to even out if we're able to keep key costs of our work. Uh, the one thing I, I noticed that these, these typical percentages is extremely important to remember that these percentages are only applicable to conventional water reactors, and they're not applicable to other reactors. For example, uh, typical advanced reactors, on, on average, their fuel costs are at least four to five times, or the variable and four to five times higher than conventional reactors. And, and I'll show you a lot what that would be. You compare it actually, you know, very similar to kind of solar PV. Solar PV, high cost and a little bit of fixed O&M. Fix uh, it's actually looking similar to uh, a conventional nuclear power plant in terms of the distribution. But what's important at the end, what's gonna determine your economic competitiveness is actually having a magnitude here on this Y axis. So if you look at that based on some EIA data, uh, what you see is that the, uh, the, the nuclear power plant is almost twice um, the uh, solar PV, as well as uh, over twice the cost of a natural gas plant, if you want to build a new conventional um, reactor. Seeing that, particularly what's what's grim about it is that under capital cost, fixed ONM and variable ONM, it's always going to be greater than than PV, and that's of course, uh, my, my, uh, you know, it's uh, it is because of near term, because near right now, you know, the grid is relatively stable. And as you add more PV, it's gonna lose its value. So then its cost gonna also go up. But for now, near term, you know, it's gonna be tough to, uh, to compete with these other, other energy sources. As I mentioned before, you know, if the variable O&M is like fuel cost for almost conventional advanced reactors, four to five times this, you can immediately see that their economic um, um, feasibility uh, becomes highly reduced. 
The great news is that we have a great fleet of reactors generating 20% uh, of the electricity over half the carbon free energy in the US. And they operate at actually at $30 per megawatt hour. And you may ask yourself, well, why is that 30 current reactors versus if you have built a new reactors at 100? Because all these reactors have already paid off their capital costs. And so you can actually get uh, very cheap uh, uh, electricity that's carbon free. So it's very important to keep the reactors running. One thing that uh, you see that uh, studies have done that 20, this, this number can be even cheaper. Uh, uh, and you know, regulation takes almost a fifth of that and half of it actually goes to a nuclear regulator, which is you know, very, very different compared to these other um, energy industries. So let's look at the existing fleet um, uh, briefly. You know, one thing they've done in terms of reducing their cost is to keep going life extensions. They've already paid their capital costs. They constantly pay for uh, addressing the spent fuel problem as well as decommissioning. They constantly you know, pay, pay this fixed rate uh, to, to, to a set fund. So keep, if you keep extending their lifetimes, uh, their, their economics, uh, and they, they continue to have very good economics. And uh, almost all the reactors have gone 40 to, to 60 years. And some of the reactors actually recently have gone 60 to 80 years, which is great news. The other thing they've done is, is power operates. And what power operating does is that it takes that levelized cost of electricity and cuts it down because you're basically using almost all existing equipment and infrastructure and just getting more juice out of your uh, power plant. And that has been done since the 1980s, last 40 years. And we've gone eight gigawatt electric of carbon free energy and saved basically 200 million tons of CO2 annually. And we've been able to do that by better understanding of the reactor power, as well as recapturing overly conservative margin, as I'll talk an example uh, um, in the next slide for, for future power up. And these power operators has been very cost effective. Their utilities have reported that they've got, gotten them on order of thousand dollars per kilowatt, which on capital cost basis is competitive in natural gas. And of course, given the much lower variable and then for nuclear, it becomes actually a very cheapest, basically almost dispatchable source of carbon free that, that uh, the US has, has ever realized. So, so it's a great, great way to, to continue to keep the existing fleet going. So I'll, I'll give you uh, an example. Well, you know, what, what can we do in the, in the future? And, and hopefully this example also tells you about why, about my other message about how regulation is really stifling the economics of a new uh, You know, one of the things, these, these reactors are water-cooled and water has a certain upper limit where it can uh, efficiently remove heat. And we call that critical heat. And the nuclear regulator assumes that our, that fuel rods, these are those pellets, and this is the uh, uh, scaled down uh, 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 fuel rod. If critical heat flux happens, the regulator assumes that there's an instant failure in this cloud. Basically, you get a, a local hotspot and your cloud is going to instantly fail. Now, physics wise, what's going to happen? The cloud is going to uh, go in high temperatures. You're going to have some localized hydrogen uh, and, and oxidation pick up, and you're going to see basically what happens to the integrity of your cloud. Uh, one way to avoid this um, or, or give more margin to critical heat flux is to improve, increase your flow rates, meaning uh, basically get a bigger pump. And there's a little, little, you know, there's there's so much you can do to increase your pump capacity. So if you look at, you know, uh, data out there um, of uh, tests as well as real experience, you'll see that there is zero, there has been never, ever a single instant failure of a fuel rod when it undergoes critical heat. So that tells you basically, this is a extremely conservative uh, view of this thermal march. It's as if you go and, uh, you know, let's say uh, you go, you're pumping gas in your car and the government tells you that you can only pump half, uh, half full because if you go full, uh, you know, if you go full, your, your engine is gonna you know, combust. You know, it's, it's just, it's never happened, but they, you know, the government's gonna force you to do that. And this is, this is uh, kind of a similar uh, margin. And in fact, you know, the industry has, uh, since Fukushima worked on uh, developing um, more higher performing fuels compared to Zircon, uh, we looked at uh, coated cladding. And you see that these, these cladding is actually gonna have much better mechanical performance at these temperatures relevant to critical heat flux. And uh, if you look at, you know, what's the survival time, um, uh, of these of, of these uh, 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 fuel concepts, you can see that the current fuel can last almost six hours on the critical heat flux. 
and this color cladding actually can last up to four days. So hopefully this is enough evidence that we can kind of remove these overconservative margins that have been recognized, but the regulator has been really resistant to remove uh, with these new advanced fuels that are kind of under commercialization in the next few years. And this is just one example of, you know, overall conservatism really limiting what nucleus true potential. Now let's move on from the existing fleet to the next 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 generation and the future of the industry. So if if I think it's pretty clear, and you saw that from that EIA, you know, LCOE uh, projections, that uh, you know, unless we go to de decarbonization uh, scenarios where price of electricity is actually much higher, uh, nuclear is not going to be competitive as it is today. So we need to make it commercial viable today in order to have it to have a strong future tomorrow. In order to do that, we have to meet that market cost, which is around solar PV type of range, you know, $60 when I go down. And uh, at the same time, we have to minimize risk. We cannot have those experience with that large reactor that I showed you. And so to do that, what industry has done and the utilities, you know, view and, and the community views is that we got to go smaller. Plants, right? If you're a smaller plant, what happens is construction time goes up. It's just a smaller um, civil engineering uh, project, construction project. There's less uncertainties and the project management goes down again, smaller project. Unfortunately, what happens if we take the conventional reactor, reactor technology and, and go it down, it's the same thing as you see with fossil fuels or solar thermal. It's economy of scale. Your costs will go up. Your o &M goes up because you have basically the same number of systems. So you gotta come up with some kind of innovations to really overcome these. And at the time, those things cannot, you know, and keep your risk. That's what the industry has done and what we propose. So some, some of the things the industry has done that try to increase the building power density for these smaller reactors relative to the large one through design or simplification. An example of design is they've taken these uh, steam generator connected to a reactor pressure vessel with these piping in the pump, and they've actually integrated it all into one larger vessel. And that allows you to have a more efficient steam generator that allows you to remove accident possibility of these pipes uh, burst, which for all you don't need that much power. That's one way to kind of improve the per watt uh, per performance. And this is similar to what the new scale uh, SMR that's uh, the only um, advanced, more or less advanced reactor that's been certified by US NRC uses. The other approach is through simplification. And this is uh, something the X300, which is uh, an SMR um, uh, uh, designed by General Electric has done. And they've basically taken the advantage of the lower power rating to remove a lot of these um, other additional uh, backup uh, water because that's not necessary for this smaller a uh, thing and now there's a whole lot of other uh, solutions that has been uh, proposed before uh, even I was born, you know, from range of digitization, robotics, advanced manufacturing, modular standardization, you know, putting them underground, going high temperatures to improve efficiency. The question becomes, you know, really where, where you should go. How do you um, choose, you know, which is the most effective method? And so when you look at what our community, um, you know, how they select is they're inspired basically by the, similar to, you know, that IA, that inspired cost breakdown that the lot of reactors see. And so they have the issues and they have to, you know, come up with proposed solutions that address those issues. But then unfortunately what happens is the question becomes, you know, can you apply those issues across these smaller water reactors, these non-water reactors. Are they applicable? So let's see even the large reactor. So within the large reactor, there is an advanced boiling water reactor technology perfected in Japan. And technology actually has been over and over again built in modern era uh, under four years. And in fact, it has a record, 3.1 years. This continues to be a record for, for a nuclear power plant construction. And it has experienced a cost that is much lower than those two plants that are currently being uh, constructed in the US. And in fact, this power plant has the concrete per megawatt electric produced compared to those power plants that are being constructed in the US. 
So you can see immediately that I cannot take two and this break and apply it to even after of same. Another um, empirical evidence is that if you look at what is the most expensive nuclear technology that has been connected to the grid recently, expected to be connected to the grid in the next five years, and it's actually those Russian uh, small reactors, small modular reactors that are purely fabricated in the factory. And you can see that they're, they're attaining 24 cents per kilowatt hour or $240 per megawatt hour. That'd be much more expensive than those uh, plants that are being built in, in Georgia. And uh, you, you ask yourself, well, why? Because I thought three production is going to be cheap. Well, there's always first of a kind issues first. And secondly, what you see here is they lose so much in economy of scale, 35 megawatts versus 1,100 megawatts, that you end up with that much, even though you reduce your risk drastically by factory producing, you're, you've increased your cost so much. So that tells you really, we got to really come up with solutions that are actually applicable to the individual rent. And that's why to understand what are the cost drivers of individual reactor systems, what we've done recently, we've actually bottom up models for these type of reactors and then come up with the best solutions. And these cost models that we've uh, built is uh, based on 1400 plus cost data based on recent and, and historic databases. We've done successful benchmark with vendor data, with public information, realized project costs, as well as some proprietary costs. And we plan to open source this to uh, next year. Uh, currently it includes all major near-term old small module reactors. Uh, and currently we're expanding it to uh, gas cool technology, sodium, salt cool technology as well. Uh, and we're focused on this near term water cool SMR because if you just look at nuclear supply chain, that these, these are the reactors that are going to uh, out of the gate for commercialization um, by 2030s uh, relative to the other things. And what this allows us to do is to evaluate, propose cost effective technology innovations of pathways. As we've done in this case for a water pool SMR, looking at different of those proposed solutions, looking at the cost breakdown and seeing basically which one is more effective. And some of these solutions that you can see, they're basically make almost no, no difference in the total uh, overnight capital cost in this. So I'll give you an example of what is one of these images. One, one is uh, something I actually have proposed uh, over 10 years ago was to instead of looking at these uh, shell and tube steam generator, why don't we replace them with these more modern uh, play type um, steam generators that has been really perfected as a play type heat exchanger in the chemical industry. And uh, you know, their resistance immediately was always, you know, what happens with these smaller channels and what happens with blockage and all these other things. But since then, there's been a lot of testing. There's been a lot of work. And actually one of the SMRs in, in France is a SMR concept uh, developed by EDF actually adopts this as a base uh, technology. And what this allows you to do is you, you're allowed to now remove so much more heat from the reactor vessel and really take that advantage of the higher energy density that fission allows you to do and really improve your power density given the same really structures. And that's gonna really uh, help with uh, cost reduction. So when you implemented this and look at the range of uh, condition, uh, we see we get you know range of uh, costs and I'll discuss, discuss shortly. So one of the uh, first thing um, we see is that the economy of scale, uh, because we've lost we've gone from you know a, o, over a thousand megawatt plant to a to one hundred seventy megawatt electric plant, it it you know is going to increase our costs, particularly our O and M costs going to be huge because we have you know more or less similar systems and it's very hard as I showed you to argue that you can really reduce your staff to single digits. And, and, and so my O&M cost is, is, is pretty high. So, so I have to really improve this. And the way we can do this is through looking at how can we get more juice out of, again, same structures. And we can do this. And one of the first things we can do is we can reduce this grace period. Now, what is this grace period? This grace period basically tells you that if I have none of my safety systems, <laughs> Uh, that are actively powered, no power from the grid, no outside help. I have two weeks till my reaches fuel down. Now, all that over 400 reactors operating today, none of them have even close to this type of profile. 
And so why would we propose to have such a drastic, such an incredible safety performance when you know the, the possibilities is 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 you know very very minute. Currently, if you look at you know recovery times for after you lose power to grid, we're talking about three, four days. Why do I need two weeks? And so if we re remove that, let's go for a week, which will be again an improvement over all the 400 reactors operating today. We can improve that power rating and we can drastically reduce the cost. And you can see on FOK cost, we're approaching about $70. And for nth of a kind uh, cost, we can actually get to that $60 per um, a megawatt hour that, that we want. Now, you look at, you know, what about other technology? This, this technology, we can do it with uh, water-cooled SMRs, whether it's a PWR with a compact steam generator or a force circulation with a, with a boiling water reactor. When you ask a non-water non reactors, they're going to be, all, they're going to be, they're currently, you know, rated at greater than $100 per megawatt hour. One of the reasons is that their grace period in some cases are actually, you know, infinite. <laughs> and so when you have such a, huge safety, great safety profile, you're gonna pay for it in summer. And that's really a big, big economic drive. The other thing you see that, can we even go further? Can we go beyond $60? Yes, we can, because right now that $60 is limited by that critical heat flux limit that I already told you how over conservative it is. All right, so now let, I'll, 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 I'll end with a few insights as well as list of my top innovations. So one of the insights, first insight is that, you know, we, to, in order to really attain these economics, we needed a pump. We need a pump to add to the design flexibility, all right? And uh, however, today, if you look at the, uh, in the US, most plants, uh, most SMR proposed plants are natural circulation or gravity driven. And when you look at, you know, where they came from, where this idea of you know, no pump for operation came from, really was born out of an era in the, in the late 80s and the 1990s, when there was a huge anti-nuclear movement, the public perception was low. And there was really not a, not a big uh, challenge to nuclear economics. Today, the case is almost switched. We have actually more than 50% support uh, from the public, but, but uh, our nuclear economics is, is highly challenged. And, and that's what you uh, see. All the US uh, products are natural circulation versus all the international products are for circulation. And that's, you know, the, 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 the ide ideology has, has, has uh, taken our hand this the other insight is that, you know, to really get to that $60 or roughly, you know, $3,000 per kilowatt overnight cost, you have to focus on reducing direct costs. You know, we cannot abandon uh, reducing that direct cost, particularly for advanced reactors. Some of their components are greater than 10% of this target capital cost in order for nuclear to be economical. So manufacturing becomes very The other one is that, you know, um, as we went larger, particularly with that experience with Japan, with the advanced boiling water reactor, it's a 1400 megawatt electric plant. As we kept going larger and larger in size, modular construction became more and more necessary to keep the project risk down and project management and schedule to a reasonable level. Now with the small reactors, we've actually reduced that size quite a bit. So we don't need as much new construction techniques or too intensive modular construction because we have already in, in some in some cases, we drastically reduce the, the amount of construction that takes place. And, you know, there's modularization in any industry. If you look at it, it takes an overhead. You know, natural gas plants really started modularizing once again. They scaled up to 800, now even like 1,000 megawatt electrics. So that's, you know, that, that, that focus has to be done uh, properly per, per plant. Now to my uh, top three innovations um, uh, that that's really that's going to make a difference is performance-based regulation and radiation protection. I've already talked about this. That we treat radiation hazard completely different than other forms of hazard. And then the, the, the next thing is, as I just mentioned, cost-effective manufacturing is, is critical. If you look back at that table, what you see is above that Russian um, uh, floating plant. You have the Ch Chinese reactors that are coming out at a very very cheap price because labor in China is cheap, as well as the uh, products in China is cheap. Today, if you want to buy a valve for a nuclear power plant that has nothing to do with actual nuclear hazard, we cannot do that because of export control rules. So we have to kind of uh, overcome this unfair um, uh, field. And the last one is, you know, high performing materials are always going to be important because power density, temperatures is going to be the first order impact on the economics of a power plant. With that, uh, I'll end my time. Thank you.